it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lekra Pavel. Um, she's a professor in the Systems and Control Group in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto. She received her, um, her bachelor's degree from, in automatic control from the Technical University of Vyasi, Romania, um, and her PhD from Queens in Canada. Um, she joined the University of Toronto after a postdoctoral stint in, uh, at the National Research Council and a bunch of years in industry, in the communication industry, sorry. Her research interests include game theory, distributed optimization, and she's authored a couple of different textbooks on game theory, optical networks, and is a senior editor for Transactions and Network Systems and the Open Journal of Control Systems. Um, and today she's going to share her take on the systems theory of algorithms and games. Um, thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Florian. Thank you, John. And th thank you, Niao, for, for the invitation. Uh, when I first heard about the topic, uh, I immediately jumped to, to Florian and I said, wow, that's such a timely topic. And then um, knowing that it's been almost, what, uh, two and a half years since we've last met in CDC in Nice, I said, yeah, sure, I'll come even if it's only for three days and uh, I'll have jet lag. So uh, thank you again. I think this is a great uh, initiative and um, um, I look forward to interact with um, uh, many of you. So what I'm going to talk today is on system theory for algorithms in games. So it, it falls within this, um, this um, uh, topic that uh, we, we all are um, discussing here. This talk is based on work with my PhD students, uh, Diane Gajov and uh, Bolin Gao. And um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the results are due to, to their own contributions. Um, it's actually, this is actually also timely because uh, part of what I'm going to be talking here is actually going to appear in a, a special issue of Control System Magazine uh, that Ariane van der Schaaf put together for the 50th year anniversary of dissipative theory of Williams. Uh, so um, uh, that's uh, why I'm sad. So what is it that I'm going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about um, algorithms in game theory. So um, that's the the other side of optimization, moving to multi-decision uh, makers. Um, and I'm going to talk about the perspective that system theory brings in. So um, this is something that uh, most of you um, know because I, uh, there are several people here that work in both optimization and, and game theory. Um, this is um, um, a theory that originated in economics and social scientists. And uh, the classical setting assumes that... Uh, um, we have a Nash equilibria that arises as a result of strategic interaction um, uh, during players in a one-shot game. Yeah? So the traditional explanation as to why and when uh, such a Nash equilibrium arises, and then there's a lot of equilibrium analysis based on Nash equilibria and its refinements. A lot of the thing relies on the uh, assumption of players' rationality, and the fact that all are common knowledge, so complete information um, type of a scenario. Now, in a learning or online setting, which is much more um, useful in engineering a network system, uh, we see there the example of ad hoc wireless ad hoc networks or social networks, um, and then it can be seen as arising as a limiting point of repeated play in which players actually um, update their decisions, uh, strategy or action, uh, depending on how the game and how the others react. And uh, the NE is going to be that collective strategic state where the decisions are individually optimal for each and there's no reason to unilaterally deviate. The players are non-cooperative in the sense that you have several optimization problems, each with their own individual goals, but those individual goals are coupled one to another. Um, at the same time, it's not um, distributed optimization because they only have authority only on their own action, on their own decision, which means that this means it's just part of that optimization argument. They should reach a Nash equilibrium in an online and autonomous manner, and yet an NE as an optimal point in an optimization problem is unknown a priori. So this is where the algorithms in the game theoretic sense uh, come, and they are actually looking to seek an NE. Um, and obviously the information that's available is critical. 
Um, in the past, what do I have here? Uh, probably, I'd say, more than 20 years ago, there have been a lot of work in applying um, game theory in engineering networks, and the, the area has actually um, grown tremendously since when I started. I started about 20 years ago to work into this. And so you have everything from congestion control, power allocation, uh, mobile sensors and robots, uh, demand response in energy systems, um, and the players could be anything from network nodes, routers, channels, robots, um, that one way or another share some resources, uh, be it bandwidth, power, capacity that, that the system has, and they have self-interested objectives. Now, in the game theoretic literature, in that uh, context of coming up with a Nash equilibria, there have been a lot of algorithms and dynamics that have been proposed. So I've listed here just a number of them. Um, the, the most common ones are, and the most known as are the best response type of a play, a fictitious play, uh, which is inspired by the best response, but it's against an empirical distribution of opponent's play. Gradient play, which is a better response play. Projected gradient play, in the case in which you have to do some projection to maintain, to, to remain within the feasible set. And then you have the side um, of, uh, of this regarding um, information. So you have reinforcement learning in terms of payoff based learning, Q learning play, bandit learning, uh, proximal point algorithms, or forward backward inspired by the operator theoretic. There's an, an, a number of them. And then you could have settings in either continuous kernel games where the actions are in an unaccountable uh, set, yeah, so it's an infinite um, type of a game, um, or finite action games, uh, evolutionary games, dealing in both discrete time or continuous time. And yet, most or a lot of these algorithms actually work in special cases, some for zero-sum game only, some for two-player, two-by-two two games, potential games, strictly monotone or strongly monotone games. So each comes with their own um, assumption restrictions. So the, 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 the interest in, in, in my research group has been actually to, to see whether we can find some commonality, some unifying thing. Why is it that some work in certain situations and others not? Uh, how can we generalize them in a systematic manner? How can we relax their informational requirements? And system theory is the one area that we found um, has very good um, means of doing so, and this is what I'm going to be talking today about. Yeah? So the other side of things um, that I'm going to mention at the end is actually looking at some operator theoretic um, work that also can help with some of this, but at the expense of not pro being able to provide the intuition and the insight. So what I'm going to be able to show is that some popular game theoretic algorithms can be cast, actually, as instances of a feedback interconnection, a feedback system between some dissipative or passive dynamical system, the um, zeta that you see there, and some specific game mapping, yeah, the phi that you see there. And then what I'm going to be showing is that convergence to national equilibria then follows from a standard system on passivity theory based on simple and concise arguments um, and based on the passivity or dissipative theory, and that it can also bring ideas to design novel algorithms or dynamics. And most of my talk, or um, almost all of it, is going to be actually in continuous time. So we move from Tamers, who was in, uh, which was in, in discrete time, then Michael basculated between continuous time and discrete time. I'm going to, to most of it, stick to continuous time. So I'm going to do just a little bit of review of dissipative and passive dynamical systems. So this is a theory that goes back, as I said, 50 years ago. Yeah. So Williams was the first one that introduced this, this concept of a dissipative system that is able to characterize basically the, uh, the absorption of the energy and the, uh, the dissipation of energy in the system. Yeah. And mathematically, he encompassed it by saying that um, such a system uh, is going to be dissipative if one can find a storage function that uh, satisfies a specific differential inequality that you see there, number two. 
um, and um, the quadratic uh, supply rate on the right, it's typically um, uh, described in terms of the uh, QS and R matrices, and it turns out that special instances of those matrices lead to passivity, which is uh, inequality three, or finite L to gain, which is number four. And this theory has had numerous um, um, impactful uh, application in, in control theory. I mean, um, uh, one can, can, uh, can, can actually think of, of, of many, many different areas. It turns out that in game theory, not so much, because typically this is not a traditional application area of, of control. Yeah. So what are the key properties that also make uh, dissipativity and, and passivity very interesting. The fact that you can actually put together systems made of um, different subcomponents that have these properties, and then when you interconnect them in either feedback or parallel, for example, you preserve these properties. And this is very powerful when you're dealing with large-scale systems. And then the other thing is that Feedback interconnection is asymptotically stable if at least one of these is strictly passive, um, making the resort, uh, resorting to the Lyapunov type um, argument where you use as Lyapunov function the storage function. Um, or this is actually giving you the small gain theorem, yeah, where you, you say that the small, the gain around the loop has to be strictly less than one. So, um, these are actually um, the properties that um, uh, we're going to, to, to see that make um, um, the application to game theory very interesting. Now, everything that I've talked so far, it's in the classical sense of dissipative and passive. In other words, a dynamical system that has the origin as the equilibria. What about if the equilibria could be anything that X bar there? Well, this is a powerful variant generalization of the dissipative and passivity that was actually introduced uh, by a number of people. Hins, Archuk's, and Pe Packard's paper was, I think, 2008 or 2009 appeared, so way more later. But basically said that if we have all of those inequalities holding for any equilibria condition of the system, then I'm going to call those equilibrium independent, passive system, dissipative system. And then if I have some extra um, specialization in the sense that if I have an extra quadratic term um, on the right-hand side uh, in terms of the output that I'm going to call output strict EIP and then involving the input as in 11, I'm going to call this input strict EIP. So those are stronger uh, properties than the just equilibrium independent uh, passivity. I can, have, uh, I, I can mention here that Pavlov and Marconi actually um, uh, strengthened this concept by, say, by providing incremental dissipative and passivity where these relations actually hold between any two trajectories, not necessarily one way is continuous, uh, conti um, constant, yeah? because an equilibrium uh, condition, this is what essentially it means. It's, it's a constant trajectory of the system. And what's important is for LTI systems, all of these concepts are equivalent. Yeah, so, and this is quite nice. Now, I'm going to, to, to make now a, a little bit of, of um, uh, detour on the monotone operator side of things, um, because this is the other part of things that, that come into play. So, uh, I'm going to introduce what's called um, a set-valued operator or a mapping, uh, script A, which is going to be monotone and it's um, variants, strongly monotone or hypermonotone, if I have a similar interconnection, you see there that I have a similar in inequality there in terms of the operator, input-output map. Yeah. And then one could have uh, co-coercive operators where I have um, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, involving the output um, as opposed to the input in the strongly monotone. And then one could have, obviously, the common um, a notion of Lipschitz operator um, uh, in which I have a, a bound um, a theta and uh, which uh, if this theta is less than one, I call the operator being contraction or non-expansive if this theta is one. 
there are some important properties in operator theory that comes in, come into play in game theory, and one of them is that I have this inverse uh, of an operator. The identity plus the, the operator itself is called the re resolvent, and that's firmly uh, non-expansive if the operator is monotone. And um, uh, an, an example that is quite important is the normal code of a closed and convex set, yeah, so that NC, uh, which is... Um, um, obviously going to, to come into play when we're going to do projections. What's interesting is that the operator theory and the passivity are actually two sides of the same thing. Because if you're specializing the operator as being a static system, not dynamical system, it turns out that a strongly monotone operator is nothing more than a a, a strict EIP or output strict EIP system. So regarding that system, um, the, the, that operator as a static operator means that I actually take all of those properties in the operator um, literature, res um, um, operator research literature and optimization and bring them into the dynamical system literature. And this provides me with the nice parallel that I can have. What also it means is that you can see here some examples of operator on the real, uh, real line. Um, those variants of monotonicity or EIP actually mean that I could have maybe some um, excess passivity. These are the cases where the green, the A and the D, strong monotonicity or co-coercive operator, this is exactly the st input strict or output strict EIP. Um, and then I could have also a lack monoton of monotonicity, uh, the case B being there, where I actually have a lack of passivity. Now, now we're getting into the, the game theory side of things. So I'm going to have a generic set of players, and the generic player is that red little guy there. And I'm going to say that his decision uh, or strategy is uh, xi and everybody else's is x minus i. He has his own individual cost, j sub i, or payoff, script u sub i, which is the opposite of cost, uh, that's affected by what the other ones are doing. And he's interested in minimizing cost or maximizing the payoff equivalently. And I'm going to say that the decision process with which he comes to update his uh, strategy, I'm going to denote that by PI, from a plant, easy to say, yeah? So that's an algorithm in discrete time or dynamics in continuous time. And everybody else, I'm going to keep the notation, it's P minus I. And what I'm going to then have is the block diagram that you see there to the right, uh, where Whatever their decision-making is actually depends on what the other ones are doing. So you have the interconnection between PI and P minus I, and based on that, they actually send their decision to the game environment where they're going to get the cost that JI, that again depends on what the other ones are doing. And I'm going to say that the overall algorithm or dynamics is made up of this interconnection between all of the dynamics of all the players. So if this was an optimization problem, I'd only have one of them, yeah? Here I have n of them, two or more. So this is what, what we call uh, a game or an interconnected uh, system. And I'm going to have that capital P, the interconnection. What is it that I want out of any algorithm, any seeking, uh, any dynamics? I want that any equilibria x bar of this p to be related to a Nash equilibria, x star. Yeah. And then what I also want is that any such equilibrium is asymptotically stable. Yeah. Um, if that's in a, uh, uh, happening, then I'm going to have convergence or maybe global convergence to an any. Yeah. Now, I might have only have attractivity, then I'm going to maybe have only convergence to the any, but definitely these are the two properties that are essential. Since this any x star is unknown a priori, one can think of, if I could make use of those equilibria independent passivity on dissipative property, it would be really useful. 
Yeah, because then I'd be able to say, well, whatever I put together as interconnected is going to hold no matter what the equilibria, and if one holds, then two is going to follow. Well, unfortunately, in a game, individual um, agent properties do not hold. And this is quite different from a distributed optimization set up where everything is separable, everything is decoupled, or different from multi-agent agreement, where, again, typical assumptions are, A, your agents are um, individually incrementally passive. You don't have such a thing. And the main reason is that because they have coupled objectives that depend on what the other ones are doing. But what about if we can rearrange the overall any dynamics or any system P, that, that interconnected P, as some feedback interconnection between some sigma and some phi. And where I can actually have that sigma and phi are maybe having those EIP properties. That would be nice because then, if that happens, then asymptotic stability or equilibria of P or convergence to the NE is going to follow easily for passivity arguments once I have that any equilibria point is related to, to an any. And this is the whole idea of what I'm going to talk to you next. So I'm going to do first for a set of continuous action games. Yeah? So I'm going to do a, a, a very quick um, characterization of the Nash equilibria in such games. Yeah? Because remember that the first condition was that any equilibria point is a Nash equilibria point. So you have the standard definition of a Nash equilibria, uh, which means that no player has any incentive to deviate from, from that optimal condition, which means that um, basically every agent is belonging to the best response map, that condition one, yeah, that depends on what the other ones are doing. And you have N of them. Yeah? In other words, an NE is a fixed point of the best response, overall best response map. This is the one basic characterization that one can use, and this is actually what best response play is relying on. Then you could have some further refinements in the sense that if I am assuming that the cost is actually continuously differentiable, yeah, nothing like that was, was assumed um, um, previously, it's just continuity typically. typically. Um, and convex in Xi, this is also common, but this is the differentiability uh, question. Then it turns out that I can characterize it any um, through a variational inequality. And this is what you can see actually as the VI over there. Yeah. And introducing that normal cone that I've briefly alluded to, that variational inequality is translating into the condition two that essentially says that the vector made of the partial gradients of each cost function with respect with their own argument and this is what I call a pseudo-gradient map, because it's not a true gradient, again, being in a game, has to perfectly balance a vector in the normal cone. So this is what you see represented there. Yeah. If the NE is in the interior, then this basically translates to the condition that the pseudo-gradient is zero. If the pseudo-gradient was a gradient, then it would be the condition that you have from optimization. Yeah. Good. So that's the second characterization, again, that could be used for generating agris. Now, you'll notice that both of these characterizations, they're actually stacked versions that essentially tell you that in order to, to have them met, you have to have the knowledge of what the other ones are doing at the optimum. So this is what we call full decision information. Yeah. Unless you have that, because of the coupling, you really cannot reach and Ash equilibrium. And then I'm going to have just a third characterization, slightly based in terms of that um, um, resolvent, yeah, based on the uh, a cone, a normal cone interpretation. If one brings the, the, the resolvent, one then actually gets the third um, characterization in terms of a projection, yeah? So it's, it's nothing more uh, than, than saying that um, um, X star, it's a fixed point of the projection evaluated at the xr minus fx, yeah. So these three stand behind a number of algorithms in um, Nash equilibrium seeking. So I'm going to, to now talk about 
some of them. Yeah. So again, the objective is to design this PI such that uh, you find that any and some typical assumptions on the pseudo gradient are that it is either strictly monotone, uh, strongly monotone, that essentially uh, generalizes the idea of convexity from optimization. Yeah. So if a function is convex, its gradient is going to be monotone. If it's strongly convex, its gradient is going to be strongly monotone. Yeah. But there I put again, as a recap, the parallels to the uh, passivity, because this is what we're going to make, uh, to make use of. And then um, I'm going to, to talk a little bit about some of these, not, not all of them. Yeah? And I'm going to also show you how you can generalize them. So, best response and dispositivity. Based on the fixed point interpretation of the best response map, one can just say, Let's just do a fixed point iterate. Yeah, so at every iteration, I'm going to respond optimally, uh, which means through a best response, to what the other ones are doing. That's your, where you see x minus ik there. Or a variant, a relaxed version, where I'm actually introducing a step size. Yeah. And convergence uh, is typically uh, shown by a contraction mapping argument. Yeah. Um, Tamer is one of the, the first ones that, that actually had uh, that with, with his uh, collaborator. Yeah. Now, I'm going to bring things in the continuous time, and I'm going to show you how you can get an interpretation and an intuition if one does that. So what I'm going to say is that I can actually say that this can be molded in continuous time, yeah, uh, if you just do an Euler um, a discretization, as this PI that you have there, yeah, so it's an ODE, assuming again that you have a single value map, yeah, so, um, and I'm not dealing with differential inclusions, yeah. And then in stacked form, I'll have the P described as over there. So essentially what this is saying is that I'm taking the vector field x dot to measure the residual from the fixed point condition. And this is how I'm driving them. Yeah. I can actually take that and represent it as a feedback interconnected system that's shown in the bottom right here, where I have a bank of first order um, low pass filters, which have L2 gain of one, and the best response map. And if this best response gain map is a contraction, then I'll have the small gain theorem condition match, which means that the feedback system is going to be stable. So it's a very nice and intuitive uh, assessment. It turns out that fictitious play, that's another very popular um, algorithm in finite action games, uh, can be also modeled to continuous time best response dynamics, be it in smooth or perturbed versions. So the same results hold. Yeah? So the same intuition holds. Good. So and I'm going to talk about gradient play or projected gradient play. So I'm going to start from the third characterization of an Nash equilibria. Yeah? And I'm going to look at the standard way in which project gradient is defined, which is, again, let's just do a fixed point iteration on that condition three. Yeah? Update now this time, not based on the best response, but if you look at the player I, um, update, he's going to use his partial gradient. It's like a gradient descent with respect to his own partial gradient. Yeah, this is nothing more. And when F, being the pseudo gradient, is strictly or strongly monotonal lift sheets, again, um, convergence can be shown based on either diminishing or constant step sizes. Yeah? And Fakine and Pang um, have, have their, uh, that in, in, in their own textbook. Now, what I'm going to, to, to show you is, again, the conversion to continuous time and the interpretation. And here I'm going to, to basically talk a little bit, uh, allude a little bit to what, what Michael said, because I'm going to take that projection, and now I'm going to talk about the projection on the tangent um, to the, uh, to, to, the, to the set, yeah? So I'm going to put that as the dynamics in PI there that essentially is saying that since I want that my pseudo gradient is actually balancing in the normal cone, then I'm going to impose that at equilibria, the tangent component is zero. So I'm going to drive the vector field with the deviation from the zero, yeah? And this is going to actually give me 
the condition that any equilibria point is an any, which is already my first condition that I wanted, so it's very nice. Now, this is not a smooth dynamical system. It's a projected dynamical system, so it's a little bit more complicated. But I can actually represent this again as a feedback interconnection. And on the forward path, I'm going to have the sigma now made of a bank of integrators in front of which I have the projection operator. And based on the properties of the projection operator, which is non-expansive, and the properties of the integrator, one can show that that sigma is actually EIP. It's passive. With a storage function, there's just a quadratic distance from the equilibrium. And what this means is since on the feedback path, I have the pseudo-gradient. This means that once my pseudo-gradient is strongly monotone, which means input strict EIP, then I have those two properties for interconnection of passive system holding. And I can actually use and show, well, it's a little bit of a work because you have to involve LaSalle and so on, but the candidate, Lyapunov, is the storage function. And you can show asymptotic stability and global convergence by standard, any, um, by standard EIP arguments. Now, this is also leading to the idea of generalizing. I mentioned that this is where the, uh, the, uh, the, the insight that a, a, a system theoretic approach can bring you. Because what you have here is actually projected gradient dynamics in two different games. The one on the left is a strictly monotone game. This is game one, quadratic both. The one on the right is a null monotone game. Yeah? So when you're going to evaluate those properties for the pseudo gradient, you're going to see that one is strictly, the other one is not. And this is how projected gradient behaves. Yeah? In other words, it cycles in monotone games. So how can you actually improve on this? And this has been, from the beginning for, for us, it was, it was this is one, one of the, the major questions. How, how can I relax? How can I understand what's happening? And how can I relax these assumptions? How can I come up with algorithms that, that actually relax this? And I'm going to tell you that in the optimization, in the, in the game theory, in the operator theoretic um, uh, literature, there's a lot uh, that's based on regularization. You're going to hear about those, yeah. Well, for us, it was quite an insight to make sense of that regularization from a passivity, from a dissipative uh, perspective, because this actually brought us to the idea of actually new algorithms that could be, could be made. So I'm going to talk about two of them. The first one is Tikhonov's, yeah, a very familiar algorithm. Uh, and the second one is, is um, um, our contribution that we called heavy anchor dynamics. And it turns out that that's actually, uh, if you look at it from a dis dis discretized version, you end up with something that's related to, to a momentum-based algorithm. It's like to Polyak's uh, um, version of it, but with a flip sign. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's very interesting connections. Now, so what I'm going to, to show is, again, the perspective of the system theoretic. So on the left, I have the feedback interconnection for the projected gradient. On the right, I have actually the feedback interconnection for a continuous version of Tikhonov. What does Tikhonov do? First of all, it's using um, diminishing step sizes, and it's using perturbations on the, on the uh, pseudo gradient, those epsilon xi. And with these, basically, they regularize the problem. Yeah? And those uh, perturbations actually have to go to zero. Yeah. So this is what you see here in, in, the, in the dynamics. I'm actually adding an epsilon x on the right. Yeah. And uh, this means that the equilibrium is going to be a perturbed any. But when epsilon goes to zero, that perturbed any is just the any. Yeah. And with that epsilon in there, the block diagram now looks as on the right, where you see that on the feedback path, now I'm going to have a strictly monotone term. So when f is just monotone, I actually force it to be strictly monotone through the epsilon identity path. And this is telling me that I'm going to have asymptotic stability uh, or convergence by standard EIP arguments. So this is essentially uh, the uh, interpretation that I had. Our extension uh, looked 
at a different generalization. And that is to do, I'm going to take that, that, that whole argument that, that I have there, the closed loop uh, dynamics, and around it, I'm going to put another feedback loop that if you see there, it's like a lead lag type. It's, it's, it's a lead type of a system. And with this lead type of a system, I get this new dynamics in terms of an auxiliary variable, Ri, that is like an approximation of the derivative. And that's why I said that it's the connection to the momentum um, terms. But this is actually, this is a correction that I'm approximating the derivative. The equilibrium is going to be actually also at the uh, any, except that I'm going to have an augmented at x and r, and they're going to match there. And now what I'm going to, to, to have is that when f is monotone, because of this new lead type feedback that I've introduced that actually is an output strict uh, EIP system, I'm going to have the overall thing asymptotically stable by standard EIP arguments. So again, and now I'm going to have exact convergence to any and monotone regime, not asymptotically or not perturbed any as in the other one. So this is um, showing you the results that this new dynamics uh, have in a strictly monotone and then in the monotone games where the projective gradient was, was, was cycling. Yeah. Um, so now this last one, uh, this, uh, this extension, um, gives me uh, the idea of a different one. Well, what about information requirements? Because remember that in the beginning I said everybody needs to know everybody else's. And these algorithms that we have, best response, projective gradient, this is what, what they're assuming. They're assuming that they know the actions of all the others. What about if they actually know only the actions of a subset of their opponents? Yeah, think about I have here a full class, and um, I can basically just see what they're doing, only my close neighbors here, yeah. So it's definitely a relaxed information um, environment, but I need to come up with an algorithm that converges in, in the, even in these conditions. So what I'm going to now say is that I'm assuming that those players are connected and the graph that connects them is undirected and unconnected, but otherwise arbitrary. And each has to uh, communicate with a neighbor. Yeah. And I want to come up with the same idea. Now I'm going to introduce the, the assumption um, on the gr communication graph on top of the pseudo-gradient assumptions. Uh, L is going to be the Laplacian matrix, yeah. So I'm going to have the same objective, but now it's going to be under partial information. Yeah. And I'm going to make use of these ideas. So what's going to be the idea? The idea is going to be that I'm going to try to use consensus, some type of gossiping. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, estimate what the other ones are doing by talking to my neighbors, they with their neighbors, and so on and so on. Ideally, everybody should come to a consensus of estimates. And this means that this bold XI is the same for everybody. And it's an estimate of the true decision vector of everybody. And the approach is starting with what we have. Now we're going to actually add some communication loop to that projected gradient dynamics where we're going to try to exploit passivity and monotonicity. And hopefully we're going to get to a convergence. Yeah? And this is going to give us convergence in a single time scale, because a lot of the results, there have been uh, a number of them, actually are a two time scale approach where agents first reach consensus and then they just uh, use projected gradient. That can be quite slow. Well, a passivity approach actually shows that you can do that on a single time scale. So what do you have there? We have the dynamics as, as, as depicted at the top, where you have the projected gradient with a correction term. So the last term, the summation, is just the deviation from the neighbors. Yeah? Remember that the consensus is uh, the goal in terms of the estimates. And then that's for the action. And then the rest of it, x minus i, is the estimate of what the other ones, and there I just want consensus. So for the action, I also want to optimize. And then I stack them up 
I put them as in four, and compactly I can represent it now in terms of some new quantities. And what are those? Bold F is an extended pseudo-gradient, where now I not evaluate at the actions of the others because I don't know them. They're evaluated at the estimates. So I'm going to, to have to use that. And then I also have some matrices involved in there that essentially allow me to select actions and estimate from this stacked or lifted or augmented state vector. This bold X is the augmented state vector of everybody, which means both decision and estimates of, of the others. And I'm going to make the assumption that this extended pseudo-gradient is Lipschitz. So that's not such a, such a strong assumption. And I'm going to represent the block diagram of this dynamical system as, as this big representation, where what do you see? Basically, making abstraction of the R and the S matrices, you're going to see that I have something that looks like the pseudo-gradient, uh, the projected gradient, but now it's in terms of the augmented system, bold F. I have bank of integrators that have doubled double the dimension with a feedback loop made by the Laplacian. And this gives me the idea of using candidate storage functions similar quadratic versus this augmented um, uh, state vector. Yeah. And I'm going to try to see whether I can use what I have. So this extended pseudo gradient, it's not, not even monotone, not strongly monotone in general. But I have an extra property that when I'm evaluated on the consensus subspace, it boils down to exactly the pseudo gradient. So it is going to be strongly monotone on this consensus subspace. And then the other thing is that this Laplacian L has in itself also some properties that it obeys um, of the consensus subspace. And this is the idea. So we're going to decompose this whole lifted space into a consensus and an orthogonal comp complement. And I'm going to decompose the pseudo gradient. And on the consensus terms, I'm going to make um, use of the properties that the pseudo gradient gives. And then off the consensus, I'm going to balance the shortage of passivity of this extended uh, pseudo gradient by excess passivity that the Laplacian gives me, together with some lift sheets. And this balancing of properties in the different subsystems is actually what's going to be able to show. And this is what, what we, we showed, that I can actually have this type of an algorithm converging in partial decision information if I have some condition that tells me what? That my communication graph is sufficiently connected. This is that, what condition is saying. And this is, again, a single time scale um, convergence. And then um, the current work is actually extending this based on the heavy anchor to merely monotone pseudo gradient in partial decision information via some strict EIP augmentation. So everything that was up to here was in the context of agents having either the, all of the information from the others or partial information from the others, yeah? And some gradient information. This was, they needed that. Now we're going to move into the setup where they're only knowing the realized payoff or the realized cost. They don't know the structure of the cost function to evaluate that gradient. And this is bringing us to the reinforcement learning setup. So here, again, a very quick um, review of finite action games uh, where typically um, players have randomized strategies. They have big strategies. How much time do I have? Okay. And in that context, if one goes through the same um, setup for a Nash equilibria and mixed strategies, which, by the way, always exists as opposed to a pure Nash equilibria, one can characterize it as a fixed point of a best response or of a, a regularized best response, and then one can come up with fictitious play or best response play. But now everything, again, depends on knowledge of the payoff, which is typically in, in finite action. If they only know the realized payoff, which is that pi i, that's, things are quite different because now what I have is that the dynamics is supposed to get 
feedback from the game itself, not from the others. So you have the coupling, but it's through the game environment. There's a minimal information requires. And typically, the algorithms make use of a score variable. Um, that's denoted in, in here as zi. And then based on this processing on the score variable that in essence would have to depend on this payoff, they're mapping it back into the strategy space via a static map, sigma i. Typical sigma i is going to be a soft max. Yeah? So that's basically trying to, to, to regularize so that uh, you don't end up with uh, set valued best response maps. And this is called also the logit function. Yeah? And I'm going to just compare here two very um, well known. One is the payoff learning that Erevan Roth introduced in 98. The other one is Leslie and Collins Q learning introduced in 2005. These are similar algorithms that behave quite differently. The payoff uh, reinforcement learning converges in two players, potential games, two by two players, but it cycles in two player zero sum games that have a unique mixed Nash equilibrium. Rock, paper, scissor game being one such example. On the other hand, Q learning convergence in such games. Why? So, again, this can be explained by, by passivity. And not only that, we were able to actually generalize to n player, not only to two player. The whole idea that um, um, Leslie and Collins used also is to use stochastic approximation and to come up with the ODE that characterizes the algorithm. And they were actually using it based on a connection to a smooth best response, and this is how their convergence was shown. Our approach was actually to deal it in the dual space, not related into the dynamics in the X. And this is what allowed us to actually generalize it. But now, put together here this, the rock, scissor, paper game. On the left, you have the scores. On the, on the right, you have the strategies. Blue is payoff. Red is Q learning. And you can see definitely that you, you have the cycling behavior in the payoff learning, yeah, and uh, the convergence in the <clears throat> Q learning case. If I look at the dynamics in block diagram, this is how the picture looks. On the top, one of them is EIP made up of a bank of integrators. The other one is strictly EIP because of the property of the sigma map, which means that I'm going to have convergence in the right case and not necessarily in the left case. So this is very nicely what we've used. We've generalized this to end players, and not only that, but also to hypermonotone games, which means cases where I'm not even having only monotone. So Based on this, um, this is um, the paper with Bo that, um, <clears throat> that, that we had in, in TAC last year, and now we're looking at dual space algorithms for continuous games, uh, uh, generalizing the mirror descent um, uh, ideas. So this is where I'm going to stop. I'm going to say that there are def definitely several instances where system theoretic um, principles show uh, insight and intuition. And um, they provide us with extension and ideas to how to generalize. Um, and um, there's differences compared to the opti distributed optimization, multi-agent agreement. Um, but this is what brings the fun yeah, and the challenging part. And um, our conjecture is that most such conversions algorithms actually have some kind of dissipative passivity at play. Yeah, so this is what, where I'm going to, to close. So thank you. Thank you, Laika. Um, I guess we'll take some questions from the audience now. So in traditional equilibrium-seeking um, algorithms, they normally have a behavioral interpretation, such as better response and so on. Mm -hmm. So do, do your modifications like the lag field and heavy anchor case also admit such an Yeah, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a better response play with a correction for, with a prediction of what, what what the other one is doing, yeah? That derivative term, it's like it's also asking, oh, I'm predicting actually what the other one is doing, yeah? So that this is what the interpretation would be, yeah. Uh, look, is there any simplification that arises if you have symmetric games? If I what? 
symmetric games. If you have symmetric games, definitely that's going to be because you're going to um, you're going to have symmetry <clears throat> in in between the, the matrices that are involved there. Yeah, and um, a, a lot of times um, um, that symmetry is going to help technically. Yeah, so we haven't looked at it, but but definitely it's going because to be because the the best response functions will have the same structure. Yes, and yes. Which could be exploited. Exactly, exactly. We haven't looked, but definitely it's going to be uh, something that, that can be, yeah, so. There's a question here. Thanks very much. Uh, your structure for the, um, the heavy anchor looks like the sort of thing a control engineer might do to put in derivative control, which would then give you a trade-off between speeding up the algorithm and noise sensitivity. Exactly. Do you see the same sort yes. of thing happening? Yeah, that's, that's why, what I was saying, actually. That, that, uh, that um, heavy anchor thing, if you look at it uh, as a discrete time through a discretization, is related, actually, to something that, that Polyak had in, in his um, uh, momentum-based algorithm. Uh, also optimistic gradient descent that other people have looked. So they are a uh, very interesting connection to that, yeah? So, uh, and, uh, and it turns out that it's, it's quite related to, to them, yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Anything from the online people, Giuseppe? No. In that case, uh, maybe I'll ask one question if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I mean, a lot of this is in continuous time, yes. right? Which means it's, sometimes you can argue that might make sense, but in a lot of cases where you have communication, people don't tend to communicate continuously. Um, does any of the systems theory offer any hope to basically discretize it in a principled way? Yeah, so um, obviously you know that uh, to take that, uh, that's, that's, that's a difficult thing to have something that's general taken from a continuous time to a discrete time. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's something that we're lacking. But I can tell you that my students have worked at, for example, this heavy anchor. Uh, Diane has worked at the discrete time version. It's a, a little bit messy than in continuous time, but it's doable, yeah? So, and, and that's always, uh, always the case, yeah? But um, um, you are right in the implementation. It's a discrete that counts. Um, what what I, I find, it, uh, it's probably... Uh, something that that Michael had, which is, you'd like the both uh, uh, the, the the advantage of both worlds. You want the intuition of system theory because this is actually, I mean, you get insights that otherwise, looking at pages and pages of proofs in optimization or in operation theory, doesn't tell you what's happening. Um, but at the same time, it'd be it'd be nice to have a path forward directly to move. And uh, I think. Unless you put a little bit of work, that path forward doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Maybe in the form of a class of special integrators for these exactly. types of systems or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, um, I guess we'll end it here and thank, uh, thank Lakra for her excellent talk. Thank you.